All right, everybody's got a shot at it. Let's run the ducks back again. Good luck, everybody. And here we go. All right, Ryan, I hope you don't win again because that just wouldn't be fair. Ooh. Ridiculous fondling cardboard. What is up? Welcome back to Fondling Cardboard. I'm your host, Mike Lacusta, aka the Golf Card Collector. And welcome to the Open Championship. We've got all the best golfers in the world gathered together at Royal Troon Golf Club to find out who will win the final major of the year. An unlikely character finds himself sitting at the top of the leaderboard. That's Dan Brown. And no, not the 60-year-old author of The Da Vinci Code. Just some random British guy that even the golf analysts don't know who he is. Dan Brown sits 6 under par after round 1 with a blistering 65. One stroke behind is Shane Lowry of Ireland. And it's great to see these Europeans... Uh, England and Ireland sitting at the top. What do you what do you call them? Because I know they call Europeans everybody on the mainland. Is Ireland and and part of the UK? Anyways, uh, third place we've got Justin Thomas, which is a shock to a lot of people since the two-time major winner has been finding himself in a pretty deep slump lately. But for him to put together one solid round is good news for Justin Thomas fans. Fourth place we've got a few characters. We've got Xander Shoffley, the reigning PGA champion. My Canadian golfer, Mackenzie Hughes, or Mac Hughes, as he goes by. We've got Alex Noren, Nikolai Hodgegaard, Justin Rose, Corey Connors. Actually, Corey's not to uh, sit there tied for. He's, he's in the next group at one under par. Anyways, our uh, big, big names such as Brooks Kepka, who's at one under par, uh, a very roller coaster ride for Brooks today because he uh, had a few bogeys to begin, but rattled off four straight birdies to bring it into the red by the end of 18. And I'll end this little open recap with the biggest name in golf these days, anyways, and that's Scotty Scheffler. Scotty's sitting one under par, and even though he's five strokes back of the leader, Dan Brown. Uh, Vegas still has him as a 5-1 to one favorite to win the event, which is just bonkers. As you know, I host a golf card fantasy pool. I'm not going to go over all the details because that's maybe a waste of the other listeners' time, but I will mention that we hit the goal, so we got more than 30 entries. In fact, we got 38 entries, so the G-Gum Tiger Woods card that I dedicated a big portion of last week's episode to is going to be awarded to the first place finisher of the Open Championship pool, so congratulations uh, in advance to whoever wins that. The only other thing worth mentioning is that yours truly, Mike Lacusta, sits tied for fourth place in the pool. So not bad. Usually I'm towards the end. So fingers crossed for a good weekend. All right, here's a quick rundown for the episode today. We have a continued conversation on networking, and I'm going to share with you a special tool or technique called the networking brief can't wait to get into it and uh, then we're going to get into mailbag and card of the week before i share some final thoughts on networking and some other topics here we go here is a topic that i guarantee you've never heard uh, particularly in the context of the sports cards hobby and that is a networking brief now what the heck is a networking brief But before I define exactly what it is, I'm going to share a little story from my past to kind of explain why I'm even bringing this up. So when I finished university as a mechanical engineer, I moved from British Columbia to Alberta to work in oil and gas. Now, my granola friends back home, you can shut it. Yes, I was chasing the money. Anyways, I got here and worked a bit in oil and gas uh, and the economy just completely took a 180 within a couple of years. 
and it went from a very lucrative uh, uh, growing industry to the complete opposite everybody got laid off companies were shutting down and you couldn't buy a job and i was i was working retail i ended up working at the mall selling uh, outdoors equipment and clothing and a friend of a friend worked at global news which is a big new you know conventional news company here in cal in calgary and they said, would you be willing to do an interview uh, just about getting through the recession that we were experiencing? And it was called Surviving the Slump News Series. And so I said, sure, well, can't hurt, whatever. And at very least, it'll help me with my public speaking skills. And so I did the interview and it went really well. And they said, hey, we'd like to have you kind of be a reoccurring guest, you know, as long as you're interested. So for once a month, at every you know the first Wednesday of every month, I appeared on the six o'clock news, uh, talking about some kind of career or job searching skill set, and part of that could be negotiating compensation packages. Another topic could be interviewing as the person being interviewed, and one topic was networking. And it's an incredibly important aspect of finding a job when you are not in a high growth market. So when when you need to find a a target, a specific position, um, and and whether there's high competition or it's just not a job that gets hired for very often, you need to put yourself out there. You need to make connections. You need to not only have people who will hire you but people who will give you recommendations and introduce you to the next person and uh, give you other suggestions once they get to know what your actual goals are so i as kind of com- combined with this whole news series it connected me with a, a company uh, an outplacement agency who helps people find jobs and they were kind of the experts when it came to this news series they would say you know, here's the, buy the book, and I would kind of be the student in the situation and ask questions and then demonstrate that I've learned this new skill. That's kind of the context of the thing. So uh, through that, we used to attend what they would call power networking sessions. And it was twice a week for a couple hours in the mornings on like Tuesday and Thursday, 9 a.m., something like that. And a bunch of people who had been laid off recently or who were looking for some kind of career or career change gather together in kind of a boardroom or a bit bigger than that not quite like a, a, a convention center or anything like that but but like maybe a little bit bigger than a boardroom and we would kind of be sitting in these tables and to kind of take turns introducing ourselves heck it felt like it felt like alcoholics anonymous you know hey i'm mike i'm unemployed i've been <laughs> i've been unemployed for two months i've got my two month chip anyways so um and, but there, and then there'd be a facilitator who would kind of have like a topic of the day and, you know, it wasn't preachy or, or really like a classroom. It was very collaborative because they recognized that these people who were laid off, especially at that time, uh, there's a lot of brilliant people, you know, who were just companies were shutting down. And so everybody had to go. It wasn't just, it wasn't just cutting fat on these organizations. It was cutting the bones off. So, um, so there's a lot of great people in these power networking sessions. And one of the things that they had us do was prepare a document. And the document was called a networking brief. And when you first look at it on first glance, it looks like a one-page resume sort of thing. But it's not a resume. It's very different. Because the goal of a resume is to illustrate your skill set and how it matches with a position. Whereas a networking brief is more something to define what you are, what your goals are, what your networking goals are, your hobby goals, career goals, whatever the context is. I'm going to run through some of the information that is on a networking brief. So obviously you'd have your name, your contact information, social media handles, maybe a really brief, you know, uh, overview or biography, uh, and then a description of your expertise. So for me, you know, I'd talk about golf cards or podcasting or that sort of thing. Uh, Hobby um, uh, sports pools. Then there'd be a section about goals and interests. So, you know, if I were to uh, create a networking brief, I would talk about my Cosmic Goodwin Champions Cosmic Golfer PSA 10 set or Golf Diamond Relics sets. 
Or I might say that, you know, I'm a Matthew Wolf uh, and Tiger Woods player pc -er. Or I might have a section on there saying that I'm a Arizona Coyotes team collector. Now, the important part is that it's not just a list of things that you like to collect or, or things that you do, but the important part is what are the goals and interests related to those lanes. So, you know, for the Goodwin Champions Cosmic set, for instance, I might be missing a few key players that are difficult to get in PSA 10. So I might list them and say, looking for these two to complete my set. Or you might say, you know, I'm interested in getting a super fractor of a golfer so that I can take a stab at doing my very first rainbow. Basically things that others can help you with. Then comes another important section, uh, networking objectives. So what are you looking to achieve through networking and building connections and friendships? Are you looking for finding rare cards and you just need a wide network to find them? Are you looking to get uh, industry insights? You know, you, you want to start a, a content channel or podcast or something along those lines and you just want mentors and connections to you know, host on the show and vice versa? Or do you just live a very localized hobby life and you're just looking for, you know, people nearby uh, to, to get together at the local card show or trade night and you just want someone's phone number so you can send them a text before going so that you can confirm if there's going to be a friendly face there. Whatever the goal is with trying to make these connections, it's important to explicitly say that so that others know how they can engage with you. Next up would be like recent activities and projects. So for me, that would be things like, you know, the, the sports cards pool, uh, trying to grow a mailbag in the Golf Cards and Memorabilia Facebook group and getting more engagement with that. Or it might be like a podcast series that I'm working on. I, I kind of spoiled it a few episodes ago, but I'm interested in sort of the darker side of the hobby and how does uh, de mental health and depression and anxiety and ADHD and impulsivity and those, these kinds of things uh, relate to sports cards and escapism and coping with past issues. I mean, heck, it's a pretty deep thing and I haven't launched into that discussion uh, full on yet because I really want, I want to get it right and, and I want to self-reflect before I get into it. But anyways, heck, you know, if I could condense that down into a sentence, that's something I might put as an ongoing project on my networking brief. And then lastly, uh, which is, I mean, I don't think it's the most important part because I believe in just giving to the community, but, uh, you know, we gotta acknowledge that life is a transactional uh, thing sometimes. And you should have a section called value proposition where you can illustrate how you can help potential connections. Now, this might feel very businessy, and fair enough, it kind of is, but it's still, it's good just to get this stuff down. You never know what kind of people you might engage with and how this sort of thing might help your relationship. So things I'm thinking of are like, obviously for me, I might have a, have a guest on the podcast and that might help both of us. Or, you know, I might have expertise on the subject of golf cards or specific sets of golf cards. Or it might be that I have a bigger connection than a lot of others. And if they have questions or are seeking cards, I might be able to help them find them or get answers. So how could this networking brief document be used in our hobby? I mean, you can imagine like in the business world, uh, it could be used at conferences and, you know, lunches. If you're meeting somebody that, that you don't know well, those sorts of things. But in our hobby, you know, similar thing you know intro introductions at conventions and card shows to kind of you distribute your networking brief to other attendees or sellers that have set up a table uh, networking brief could also be used online so whether it's forums or facebook groups or even just reaching out to somebody who you want to build a connection with that networking brief can help them understand you your goals what you're all about um, I personally really like having these long-winded conversations, but it can't have that with everyone. And sometimes it's nice just to get to the point and kind of share all of that information all at once. And then 
if there's a need and, and a value for both parties in having that connection, then you can launch into that kind of a discussion. Now, if you happen to have a business in the hobby, obviously a networking brief can be helpful for you for business development, introducing your card shop or business, whatever it is, to potential partners and suppliers and clients. And it's just a kind of a professional thing. It's almost like a brochure about yourself. Collaboration. So content creators, podcasters, it's just a, it's just a way to present everything that you've got going on with a potential collaborator or sponsor uh, to show how you can help them with launching some kind of campaign or promotion. All right, those last few I know might not resonate with a lot of you, and frankly, it doesn't with me either because this is just a hobby, really. Um, but what, get kind of taking a step away from a lot of the businessy kind of stuff, I mean, the, the main thing that I can imagine is trading and selling. I mean, if you've got this document that you can just post publicly on a Facebook group or a message board, then anybody, any traffic that goes by might, you know, it might catch their eye and they might take a quick read through it and say, oh, I know where one of those cards is and they'll send you a note. And there you go. You got a fishing net out there. Now, I am just so darn busy that I have not actually made a networking brief for myself in, you know, in this world or in recent years, even professionally. But I'm curious what you guys think of this concept for the hobby. And if there's anybody out there who's willing to give it a try, you know, why don't you uh, make a networking brief and show it to me and I'll give you some kudos and you might even inspire me to do it for myself. And even if you're not interested in making a networking brief for yourself, I'd be interested in hearing what you think about this whole thing. So send me a DM or comment on the post or whatever. Just reach out to me and let me know what you think. And now it's time for Mailbag, where I answer questions from the Golf Cards and Memorabilia Facebook group, questions from connections on Instagram, at the Golf Card Collector, and anybody who's asked me a question privately that I think is fitting for this segment. Now, I didn't realize I'm actually a couple weeks behind on Mailbag, so I'm going to try and crank through this. And by the way, I'm honored that I'm getting so many questions that I don't manage to get to them every week, so uh, that's just a sign that things are well on their way with the podcast. All right, first up, we got Mark Miller. He says, oh, this is a long one. All right, there are two books entitled The Price Guide to Golf Cards Part 1, Tobacco Cards, and The Price Guide to Golf Cards Part 2, Non-Tobacco Cards, authored by Philip Smedley and Bruce Burdock, that I've used to identify golf cards pre-1995. The prices are outdated, but these books are a great resource for identifying golf cards. We need an updated version, and my question to Mr. Lacusta is, would this be something that anybody would have interest in tackling? I spoke to one of the authors a few years ago about this, and it seems they have no interest in doing an update, so there's opportunity for someone to take on this project. All right, guys, I know you'll probably hate uh, me reading that entire thing off, but I thought it was important because, yeah, no, I, I think that's awesome. I, I think post-1995 is exactly where where golf cards starts to really become interesting for me. You know, 1996 is Tiger Woods Sports Illustrated for Kids rookie card. 2001 is the dawn of the, I call it the dawn of the modern golf era. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm on board. I don't have time, really, like between the two kids, uh, the podcast, work, uh, family, just everything going on. Obviously, I don't have time to write a book, but one of these days, I would love to, um, and if there's listeners out there, people in the group or in the golf card circles and community, uh, hit me up. You know, I, I'd be totally interested in co-authoring or, you know, eventually writing something with uh, a lot of support from others in the community. All right, next up is Donald Kirk. He asks, where's the best place to find value of a card and also what kind of card it is? <laughs> And he says, I guess I'm getting old. Um, okay, Donald, great question. Uh, the, the best answer is eBay sold listings. So when you're on the eBay app or on eBay on your computer, you do a search and then under the filters, you toggle the, the setting called sold. So it'll only show you cards that have actually sold. Whenever you're trying to comp a card, and by the way, the word comp means uh, comparable sale. So you're trying to find a comparable sale to the card that you have to estimate the value of your card. Um, and that's why you don't look at, at listings uh, that are for sale. You look at cards that have already sold. Now, eBay sold listings is kind of the, the main one. 
that's free, obviously. Another free service is called 130point.com. That's the number 130 point. And they compile data from eBay. Um, it's basically the same data, I believe. Both eBay and 130 point only display the last three months. Um, but 130 point might also pull from some of the other auction sites, maybe Golden or PWCC, that kind of stuff. So maybe a little more comprehensive. I also use this strange website that has been a little finicky lately, but it still seems to pull some data. Um, and it's called maven.io. That's M-A-V-I-N dot I-O. I find it can be more sensitive to getting the description correct. So make sure you're not using weird words, keywords. And in some cases, it even almost seems like it it matters that you put it in like a, in a good order. Um, I don't know if it uses AI or something to, to scan the internet. I'm not going to claim that it does, but um, yeah, it may even seem to has, have asked us access to sales data from a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Oftentimes, if I'm looking for a rare card, that's the only website where I can find information. Now, there's other apps that cost money, uh, like that whole sports card investor guy. He's got an app called uh, Market Movers. A very popular one is Card Ladder. Uh, they're very uh, popular in the podcasting circles. I know Sports Card Nonsense has, you know, dealt a lot with them. They're the, the a main sponsor for Stacking Slabs and Brett McGrath. I've never used Card Ladder myself, mainly because I don't want to pay for a subscription. But I'm going to look into it and just see if it's any good. Um, if you are a big seller on eBay, then there's also a feature within eBay called Terapeak. But that's not really for um, those of you to, that are listening to this, probably not for you because I think you have to be either like a top rated seller or have a store established on eBay. Those are some of the main ways of getting a value of a card that come to my mind right now. Um, I mean, another way, especially if you say you're getting old you know, and you don't want to uh, learn too many apps and websites, uh, you can also just post the card on the Golf Cards of Memorabilia Facebook group and get a community consensus. Or if you're in private group chats with people that you trust, you know, make sure you're getting a value from somebody who's not involved in the actual sale, someone who does not have a vested interest. All right, continuing on, Nick Smith asks, where can I find a 2001 SP Authentic Sign of the Times David Duval and Jack Nicholas? Uh, Nick? I I know that you're collecting the, and trying to complete the 2001 SP Authentic Sign of the Times. Great set. Very iconic set. Um, a lot of awesome rookie cards from that set. Uh, and, and so a lot of people have considered building the set. And so uh, just from hearing stories, uh, it's, it's kind of become common knowledge. Well, not common knowledge for the general public, but common knowledge from people who have looked into it that David Duvall does not have very many. Uh, 2001 SP Authentics Sign of the Times. I don't know why. I don't know if he literally uh, only signed, you know, a couple dozen of them, or if some of them fell off the boat into the into the waters, like uh, some famous uh, cards from the early 1900s in baseball. I, I don't know what exactly happened, but David Duvall does not have many. Um, Nick, you already are aware of this, I know, but this is for the listeners. Um, so that's some context about why you're asking for that particular card. Uh, I'll get to that in a sec, but Jack Nicholas, you know, I don't know if that's quite as rare, but you just have to pony up and buy one. So take a look through eBay, put a post on the group, and I'm sure somebody has a Jack Nicholas. Now, in terms of the David Duval, Duval uh, this is, I, I commented on your post here saying, you know, Brent Reese, who's a member in our group, uh, I believe that he has one. And uh, Nick actually responded saying, yeah, it's, he, Brent has one of the greatest copies that he's ever seen. Um, I'm sure Brent doesn't want to get rid of that card. And I know this isn't the answer you're looking for, Nick, but you're going to have to make him an offer that he can't refuse because there's not many of them out there. Uh, my only other suggestion is to, uh, you know, network, uh, look, look for others in the golf card circles. There are group chats and discords and all those sorts of things. Uh, with, you know, small little groups of golf card collectors. And some of them are certainly hoarding, you know, at least one copy of this card. My only other suggestion would be, and this is if you're feeling like a real private investigator, look back through the old uh, archives on the message boards and, uh, you know, the cardboard connection type websites. 
I don't have suggestions for exactly which message board you should be looking into, but if you can go into there, you might be able to connect with people who have talked about that card because there are decades worth of conversations still available on the internet or web archives. And if those websites are still active, you can actually reach out and try and connect with them and kind of build some rapport and eventually get one that way. If the message boards are just archived and not active anymore, then you'll have to start looking for clues about who the individuals um, are that we're communicating. You know, look at their username and search up that username in other message boards and threads to see if you can find information about them. If they mention any social media handles or geographical locations, you can start connecting dots with who it might be in the community and then uh, and then make a connection. If all of that sounds tough, welcome to sales and uh, headhunting, aka recruiting. That you know, I I know in the in the modern day and age, uh, se- sellers and salespeople and recruiters don't go to that level. But that's you know, to, to be a very successful, I guess, collector and you know, professional, you have to be willing to dig and research. All right, next up we got Andrew Pokorny. And uh, he says, besides Scotty Scheffler, who would you like to see added to the upper deck card roster? Top five. Uh, fun question, Andrew. I didn't prepare for this, so this is going to be off, off the top of my head. But uh, I'm going to say Xander Shoffley. I mean, look at how amazing he's been playing this season. Uh, and he does have a card actually coming out in the Olympic set, which is uh, Topps Chrome going to be released next month. Actually, honestly, wasn't even planning on really announcing that on the podcast because uh, I selfishly wanted to try and go get one of the uh, Xander Shoffley cards myself before I talked about it. But there you go. Cat's out of the bag. Um, all right. So that's one. Let's go with my Canadian, um, Mac Hughes. That's Mackenzie Hughes. We've already got you know several Canadians, Brooke Henderson, Nick Taylor, Adam Hadwin, uh, Mike Weir. We got lots of Canadian golfers to collect already, so maybe I'm feeling selfish with that one, but I'd love to have it. For number three, this is this is gonna be an interesting one. I'm gonna say Rory McElroy. Now I know he had cards back in 2011 to 2014 ish time frame, but we haven't had anything since. So. Let's get some some ultra modern Rory cards. All right, number four. I don't know if this is really my pick, but it's it definitely pops into mind, and that's Ludwig Oberg. Now this is kind of if if the Canadian Mac Hughes was my selfish pick, this is my pick for the community because so many people are searching for Ludwig Oberg cards, not realizing that many players in golf don't have cards yet or might never get them. So a lot of people being disappointed when they find out the up and coming star Ludwig doesn't have cards. So that's number four. And you know what? Number five, I, I'm going to give two more because my number five isn't an actual golfer. I would love to see like a Michael Jordan or Steph Curry or, you know, one of those famous athletes that I like to collect in other sports and have them added to the upper deck golf set, kind of like they did in around 2014 time frame. There's some cool Michael Jordan cards in those sets. Um, but then, so I guess I, okay, so that one didn't count. My actual number five would be Jordan Spieth. Okay, because Jordan Spieth, he's a three-time major winner. Uh, he's been in a slump for a while, but when he when he first hit the scene, man, he was, he was it. And the fact that we haven't had any upper deck Jordan Spieth cards is such a shame. So, uh, so that, I guess that's my real answer there. All right, last question. Looks like a, maybe a two-parter from Pat Bonnet. What happened to the day when U.S. women dominated the leaderboard? Uh, and then what is different today? Who will win this year's Olympic medals? All right, it's very different different stuff. Um, so the U.S. women dominated the leaderboard. I mean, I don't know uh, what happened. I mean, I think other countries just took their female sports more seriously and it just became a more competitive landscape. Uh, obviously, Nellie Korda is the greatest woman golfer on earth by a landslide. She is she is the Scotty Scheffler of the LPGA plus more. Like, like people have been calling for a head-to-head match between Nellie Korda and Scotty Scheffler in, in, in the sense of like assuming it's not like a crazy long golf course saying, look, it's going to be an even match and we love to see that shootout. 
So, you know, although it's not dominated, you know, there's not a million American flags at the top of every LPGA event, you know, your superstar is still American. Um, it's just that there's a lot of Koreans and and other uh, Asian countries that have just taken it more seriously. And they those ladies have just dedicated themselves and results are coming for them. And when you said, what is different today, I assume you were talking about the ladies golf question because obviously a lot is different <laughs> from today than even yesterday. Um, all right. And then lastly, who will win this year's Olympic medals? That's a toughie, man. Um, uh, I, 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 you know what? I'm just going to give a hot take. Uh, Xander Shoffley goes back to back. There you go. Card of the week is a nice one. This is a 2002 SP game used Justin Rose front nine fabrics autograph. And this is graded by PSA as a PSA 10. Now, 2002 was a rookie year for Justin Rose. And this is considered a rookie patch autograph card. Uh, so RPA of a very famous golfer, um, potentially Hall of Fame career. And uh, I don't know what the pop is. I'm pretty sure it's low, maybe even just one. So um, I, I really like the card. Uh, the origin is, you know, I got the card as part of a bigger deal when I was uh, purchasing a Phil Nicholson rookie card, rookie autograph card, uh, which I've since parted with. And this was kind of a, a throw in because I always wanted a nice Justin Rose card. The styling of the card is pretty cool. Instead of being like a black and white kind of base uh, design, let's say, it's got this kind of yellowy brown tinge to it. Um, you know, it, 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 it's nothing special about the image uh, or even the patch. It's a nice patch. It looks like sort of like a woven sweater uh, with like a straight line pattern and some dots. Um, the autograph's nice, serial number out of 375. You know, there, there's nothing kind of mind-blowing about the card but all of the little details come together in in a really nice card and i'm i i'm giving this away in the golf cards and memorabilia uh pool in the open championship pool um i believe second place is going to be getting this justin rose card and i'm almost i'm a little sad about it um not only because i have that personal connection i like the card itself but the other day i was uh, <clears throat> brought my son into the card sanctuary and we're flipping through some cards and I was telling him the names of all the athletes and I was asking him which ones he likes and he said I love Justin Rose and he doesn't know you know Justin Rose in terms of you know as a fan so he's talking about the card and so <clears throat> and I, I he's a two and a half year old almost three year old so I had to kind of swap some cards back and forth and almost play the you know the circus game is to see if he can pick the card out of the stack and so I can show that he really knows what he's talking about sure enough yeah he kept gravitating to this particular card I don't know what it is about it so uh, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna give it away in, to the pool as I've committed but you know I'll, I'll be on the lookout maybe for a replacement copy of this card because there's 374 other copies out there and it's cool to spend some extra time with this card not only with my son but even right now as I hold it in my hands uh, as the card of the week I just get that Fondle it a few extra times before I let it go. I'm going to finish today's episode with some final thoughts on networking. Now, some of you might be tired of hearing the word networking, but I just think it's an important aspect of connecting with our hobby and creating our community. So I want to just do a final little list here of key points about networking and advice on how to do it. So Networking obviously builds relationships and community, gives us exclusive uh, access to information and deals. We can expand our knowledge and skill set in a particular niche. There's trading and selling opportunities. We get to stay up to date with the trends in that particular market or niche. And there's opportunity for personal growth, being on podcasts, etc. Uh, being involved in different projects, supporting one another because... If we were all just staring at our own cards without sharing them and talking about them, we'd all go a little bit squirrely. And I, I think it, I think all of that alone is enough to convince you that, hey, reach out to somebody, reach out to a friend or a hobby peer, and have a conversation. 
And how you can do that, one example is to be active on social media. Posting, commenting, or private chatting, whatever you feel comfortable with, even if it's just simple as following and engaging with other, let's say, influencers, that's okay. Attend events if you can. If you can be at the National that's coming up, I think, next week, uh, or even just your local card show, or even just swinging by your local card shop to say hello to the owner, be be involved. Uh, joining online forums and communities, obviously the Golf Cards and Memorabilia Facebook group is a fine example of, of that. And be consistent, you know, regularly engaging with the network so that the algorithm stays up to date and that you can strengthen those bonds and relationships with others in the community. And lastly, final thoughts, be genuine and be helpful. Offer assistance, share your knowledge freely. If you know somebody who can help them, for instance, next week, Jason, somebody who we're going to have on the podcast, uh, after the conversation, I offered a few different names of people that would help him with an initiative that he's working on. Build relationships on trust, mutual respect, and you can't go wrong. Next week, I just mentioned it, I'm going to have Jason Joyner, who is an owner uh, and operator of a golf course in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, and he is going to be opening a card shop within his golf course. And I found it to be so inspiring that I had to reach out. We had an awesome conversation the other day. I can't wait to share it with you next week. See you then. golf card collector.